All right. Welcome everybody to Shift Happens, session 12. So your host did not get his slide deck done for today because Shift Happens. And um, <laughs> I've been running pretty hard. So today we're going to call an audible and we're going to have a town hall. And I, we were going to do it. I was going to do a, a whole session on systems and tools. And I could have probably pulled it off and given you guys a half ass attempt at that. But I would, I think I would rather just finish that and do it where I can properly source and link everything that I'm going to suggest. So uh, we will look at probably um, uh, Wednesday doing a systems and like systems and tools for a virtual real estate business. Um, so I'll share some of those things with you because I think I take for granted that I have built virtual companies since 2011. I've never really had an office and I pretty much live on the road. Cat says this is episode 11. So, well, it was shift happens cat, <laughs> but, um, Anyways, uh, so today I'm going to rely on you guys in the audience. I don't see anything in the chat and let me get Q and a in front of me. I'm happy to answer anything you guys need me to cover. Um, cat, if there's anything from the survey that uh, people will really want to hear about, I'm willing to jump in and talk about whatever you guys need. Um, Renee, I don't really have, so let me find you, Renee. So Renee asked if I could share my contact with Provident Trust Group uh, to discuss self-directed IRAs. And come find you here. So let's talk about while I'm, all right, Renee, you, you're allowed to talk. So what we're talking about here, if you guys missed that, um, the, so a self-directed IRA is a tool I've been using since either 2012 or 13. Um, I have been able to take a $12,000 uh, rollover 401k from my corporate job and turn that into around $130,000 since uh, August of 2013 is when I set that up. Um, so Renee, I, the, the company that I use, the custodian that I use to have a self-directed IRA with checkbook control, and what that means is my IRA owns an 100% of the shares in my Virginia, one of my Virginia LLCs. And that LLC just has a business checking account. So the money came from Fidelity, the, cu the custodian from the corporate 401k to Provident, and then Provident funded it into the, the company bank account for the LLC that my IRA owns. Uh, that allows me to basically be in control and, and self-direct any investment like on the spot. Other self-directed IRAs have a custodian function where they actually, you have to ask, basically ask their permission. So you say, Hey, I want to write this mortgage or I want to buy this house. You send an order. They take a look at everything, make sure it's compliant, tell you what to do, charge you a big fee. And then within 48 hours, they can usually fund your investment. For me, I felt like I didn't need or want a babysitter. Um, I wanted to be able to get, get that, retirement to be able to use that retirement money in any way I wanted. I wanted to really be self-directed. So I've had really good luck with it. Um, I, there's not many people that really understand these things. Uh, even the good CPAs, tax attorneys, people that I talk to, they don't have a good deep understanding of what these are and why they, how they can be the most beneficial. So that is what we're talking about. Renee, you are here. Um, I don't have a, a single, like an individual, a single person that I talk to at Provident. Um, they just, they have a support team. Everybody's licensed and very knowledgeable. So I just call and, and whoever I get has always been very helpful. Have okay. you, have you started the process? I have. So here's where I am. I, I barely know enough to be dangerous about self-directed IRAs. It's not like the first time I've heard it or really had a conversation about it, but the company that was introduced to me, I just didn't really feel that comfortable with. They, they seemed a little overzealous and kind of Yahoo-ish for me, like too risk, risk tolerant for me. You know, I didn't have enough risk tolerance for them. But, you know, I trust you. I like that you actually walked this path. And so here, here's what I want to just say, and I don't want it to be reactionary, but I lost a good chunk of money in this turn. And Did you sell? I didn't sell. You haven't lost you know, anything. I mean, no. Well, not, not if you didn't sell. 
I mean, it might take you 30 years to get back to Dow 20, 29,000. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Okay. You haven't recognized See, your I loss. knew something was coming. I knew. All right. So. No. So here, here's the deal, Renee. Like, I'll, yeah. I'll, I don't know. You were on the last session. I think we're, I mean, we're obviously seeing a rally now. I think that's based in. Um, not to be, uh, it's based in naive optimism, in my opinion. Um, I think that we have not seen the downside of the market. So my advice to you is, is if you're thinking long-term with this money, which if you're thinking mm -hmm. of a self-directed IRA, that tells me you have a long-term mindset. You will have an opportunity probably 12 to 18 months from now, the market is going to go ape shit because we just put six trillion extra dollars into it. The reason you saw the historic bull run that you saw from 2009 all the way through a few weeks ago, uh -huh, uh -huh. a lot of people don't understand. They think it was really what politicians and business owners and people did. It was what the Federal Reserve did. We printed a bunch of monopoly money, injected this liquidity into the market, inflation went wild, and anyone who was holding debt went on this amazing ride, right? And that's what formed the debt bubble that would have popped in the last few weeks, but it didn't. We just printed more money. So what that's going to do is create another historic bull run that makes the last one look, look like child's play. So uh, the, the name of the game here is wait, like hold your position. Don't recognize your loss. Wait until that hits. And when the market goes on a tear, you need to roll that money out and as, as take on as much debt as you possibly can. And when I say debt, guys, I do not mean consumer debt. Like I mean, investment debt. It's cash flowing, passive income investment. You should you should because debt and in an inflationary period, you either get eaten alive. It's the largest redistribution wealth wealth redistribution tool in the world. So it, it takes from the rich and gives to the poor, or it takes from the poor and gives to the rich. It just depends on whether you're a consumer or whether you're an investor. And what we're likely to see, because of, as a result of all the levers we pulled, is this is going to prop up the markets and it's going to roar like you've never seen before. And if you can use low, low interest debt in this environment, you think about it. If, if, if the, a dollar, if you pay $100,000 for an asset today and inflation roars for years and years, while, while someone's paying down your principal and interest on that asset, your dollars that you use to buy it are also more power, less powerful in the future. So the lender is actually the one at the disadvantage. So what I'm suggesting, Renee, is sit and just sit tight. Don't get emotional. Wait it out because I think what you're going to see is because of the way that, that the central banks reacted to this on a global level, I think you'll see the market rebound and probably bl blow past Dow 29. And then at that point, roll out into a self-directed, use that cash as a down payment and, and get as much debt as you can get, like commercial real estate debt. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. go to, even if you're doing single family homes, go to community banks and get blanket liens across a bunch of houses. But the, the, the way to really thrive in this, like we're, that's one of our tagline is how to thrive in a changing market. How you thrive is you take on it in, in this environment where you know inflation is going to favor you, the buyer over time, you should spend every damn dollar to your name. And you know, that self-directed IRA can be great because you can use your cash as a down payment and get leverage through the business through that because it's technically a business and it can get a, an asset based commercial loan. So I would say like, just sit tight. Don't, don't sell your position because then you lose and yeah. I could be wrong. There's a whole lot of levers that'll be pulled between now and then, but it seems to me we're not, we're committed to not accepting what's happening to us. And we're just going to keep printing and printing and printing and printing because we believe that's the solution. I, it's too late. I, there's no sense in, in arguing the, the merits of that or against it. But I think the result of it will eventually be, I think we'll see some potentially stagflation like we did during the Jimmy Carter era over the next several months, maybe year. And then it will start to break loose whenever we get our footing back under us. And we're going to have one hell of a time then. Um, so that's what I'd like to see you get prepared for is, is understanding how to properly use debt when that account comes back, then roll it over. But for right yeah. now, okay. right I, heard, now, I understood I would, what you said. I would mm -hmm. say sit tight. Okay. And in the interim, it's called private dent with the T not yeah, P R O V I D E N T. So provident trust group. If you okay. guys are interested in self-directed IRAs, Provident Trust Group is the one I chose after underwriting probably a dozen. 
Um, the uh, uh, some other in trust is a trust is one that a lot of people use, and equity trust is another that, and those are both not checkbook control. But those are kind of the top three. That those were my three that my, when I got my short list, those are the three I chose from, and I chose Provident because I had more control. And like literally, when I write a private mortgage, I the the title company sends me an email and says, "Here's what we need." I drop, I call my attorney, and I'm like, "Hey, can you? I'm out of town. Can you just drop a check for X amount, uh, or can you drop by my bank and get the check for you know that that I had made up?" So I run this virtually. Like I don't even like I don't. It's within hours. I fund my my mortgages, and a lot of times the closing attorney goes to my bank and picks up the cashier's check up for me. I All have right. another question, but I know if there's other people in the queue, I'll just put my question in the queue. Well, no, go ahead. I, um, okay, I was going to say that or Thursday. Um, how so? If some if this is a uh, question around the probate so uh, you know if somebody already has chosen a um, attorney and they're kind of like a fourth of the way through a process I'm, go I'm going through this right now I think this attorney is not great just in their communication and the emails and it's kind of like where's a, a moral and ethical approach to if somebody would want to make a change or do you make a suggestion and are they going to have to the, the PR and are they going to have to start all over again in their pocketbook or do you just kind of wait this thing out if they're more of a nuisance and not a disaster from a customer service standpoint? Well, I think it's, you have to look, I mean, are, is, is, are, is their behavior hurting the family or is it just frustrating you? It's just frustrating. Yeah. yeah it's kind I of think, like bad and, bedside manner. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is going to cause some challenge and probably some additional cost if you have them start fresh with a new attorney. Um, I, I think that candid communication is probably your best solution here. Just pick up the phone and say, listen, I, this is the, my clients have this perception and I'm going to tell you, I share that. And what can we do to fix this? Like, I need you to step up. And oftentimes that's all it takes because we are human. We don't like to disappoint people, right? Or most of us don't. And if they blow up and show you their ego when you make a, 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 a you know respectful request like that, then they're like, okay, well, I, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give my client advice that they should find a better attorney because you're clearly unprofessional and don't want to take any responsibility or accountability. So we'll we'll see who else we can find. But yeah. probably probably you'll get the opposite and they'll fall in line and say, oh, I'm sorry, it's just been really tough. My kids this and that and trying to work from home and get my business on, you know, in a virtual office, like we're all facing challenges. So give them some grace. And I would say, have a really candid conversation without the client present. Just talk to the attorney and be like, listen, here's what they're telling me. You need to step up. I'm just letting you know. Yeah. I figured that would be the answer. Thanks. I just wanted to kind of bounce it off of you. Thank cool. you. Mm -hmm. Thanks Renee. All right. Next, um, I'm guessing this is from Facebook. Cat pasted it in. Chad, please discuss how you feel the pandemic is going to affect our probate leads. Do you think they're going to be looking to sell quicker than the past? Also, where do you think real estate values are going in the next three to six months? Um, I'm not sure who asked that. So whoever it is, uh, we so we talked about this. I think it was, um, I think it was Wednesday on on the last session we talked about this. And um, my read on this, I think just like in stocks, like we just talked about, there's a lot of like supply demand economics were, were in the favor of single family homes coming into this. Um, and I think that a lot of people don't have a deep understanding of macroeconomics and what being part of a global economy really means and what printing $6 trillion really means. So they remain optimistic based on what the National Association of Realtors and, and other media outlets who, who depend on property values going up and consumption running wild. You know, they're, they're believing what they're hearing. I believe something different. I think you're going to see in, in a short period when we do, when we do reopen the economy and realtor real estate professionals can move around. I think you'll see a rally and I think it's going to look like we're going all the way back to like the, the market peak. Um, 
what I believe will happen is you're going to see a cultural shift in this country. We've shown how willing we are to just lay down and give up our liberties. So I think that's going to stick around for anyone who hasn't had COVID-19, especially for the elderly, they're going to be more hesitant to step out into public places. They're going to be more hesitant to spend money. We've already seen retail sales are down about 30% below the, the low of 2008-9. So consumption has basically, it hasn't stopped obviously, but consumption has drastically retracted. And we're going to see a negative GDP for this quarter, certainly, probably the next quarter, and potentially beyond that. So what I see happening is out of the gate, we'll have a rally and everyone's going to be like, yes, I told you so. And then the reality is going to hit the real jobs reports, the real number of small businesses that failed, the real numbers of agricultural farmers who can't produce, can't ship food and get this out to the world. We're going to start, we're going to have to face some pretty sobering facts and we're going to see the people who understand the economy are, are talking in, in this direction. They seem to have a belief consistent to mine or a prediction. Um, so I think you'll see a rally and that's the, like, right. You know, from the time we open our economy, probably for 30 to 60 days, you want to plow as much business into that window as you possibly can, because prices will, will be supported. Optimism will be driving the market like emotions are driving the stock market right now. And the Fed's printing money. Everything's good. It's going to be fine. We're back online. Best year ever. And then reality will begin to set in. And I think what you'll see there, you'll see a, a rally. And then you'll see we'll come down and we'll find the real value of assets. Stocks, bonds, real estate, everything. Real estate has strong economics. As you guys heard me say in session one when we started this. I was, I was very bullish on single family homes. Um, they were, we deleveraged in 2008. I mean, we just took the debt from the people and put it on the, the Fed balance sheet, but it wasn't on ours. So we had a healthy ownership index level. Like it was, people were only spending 16% of their income on housing, even though like a lot of appreciation has happened. There's a lot of good things there, but real estate is a lagging indicator to the broader economy. So when your broader economy goes to hell, you have to expect if, any, if, any, if, if it behaves like it always has historically, then real estate is going to be impacted. With low, lower incomes, lower consumptions, you're going to see rent soften to come back into line. The average American was spending 35% of their gross income on rent coming into this. One in four was spending over half of their gross income. That's not sustainable. Rents will correct. Same thing with prices. You have divorces are spiking right now. Um, that's that's going to create some demand, but it's also going to set some some. It's going to realize some losses. So when a couple splits and neither one can afford the home on their own, that becomes a distressed asset. Now, hopefully, in thirty, sixty, ninety days, you produce two buyer, two other consumers out of that, and then you create two households, two coffee pots, two toasters, two sets of furniture. So there's there's things there's there's things that can affect the com the economy positively about that, but it's also going to affect pricing negatively. When you see those distro people who have to sell in that environment, are going to to set new low low markets. So I don't know exactly what it likes looks like, but what I expect is a rally where everything looks like it's amazing and we're right back to Q1 2020, and then I expect it to stall out and we'll have a very quiet cold period probably through Q4 of 2020. And then hopefully, like my best, my, my optimistic outlook is Q1 of 2021 will start one of the biggest runs of your career. And there will be more money to be made in real estate probably than ever. Um, and the name of the game there, just like I told Renee, is you, you better be getting your hand on every asset you can and you better be leveraging cheap debt. Otherwise, you're going to face headwinds yourself and your own and your own personal finances for the rest of your life. So use cheap debt, get it by income producing assets whenever you whenever it's you know, whenever you've seen a, a recovery and you know how to how to value those assets. Right now, a lot of people are rushing in and buying. And for me personally, until I see, you know, what, what the recourse is in this new economy, like how do you recover an asset? How do you clear a tenant who's not paying? What does that look like? What is the judicial backlog? Um, and it's going to be different market to market and asset to asset. But for me, I'm not buying anything if I have no recourse on it right now. I would rather, I mean, personally, 
I have moved all of my cash out of banks and into money market uh, or out of the banks that have lines I have lines of credit with. So if they call lines, they can't, they can't take the money out of my deposit accounts. And I'm sitting in money market. It's bouncing between 2.4 and 4%, but it's keeping pace with some of the reported inflation. And eventually I'll move that back over and start buying like crazy. I think that is probably fourth quarter or first quarter. Um, I think prices will correct. I don't know how far. I think you're going to see a softening and how homeowners react emotionally will depend on how deep that goes. We are going to see massive defaults because loan mods, they didn't really work in 2009, 10, 11. There's a 70% default rate in the first quarter following a loan mod and a 90% default rate in the first year. They just don't work. People like if people were unemployed and having trouble finding work and the economy hasn't, hasn't caught back up, where are they going to get the money? Can't get blood from turnips. What it will do is just extend out the period of, of distressed assets. Um, I'll remind you guys on Monday, we're going to be having a guest, uh, Frank Patrick, a friend of mine, a friend of all the leads. Uh, he, in 2008, 9, 10, 11, through about 14, he trained REO agents. And he uh, he's going to be teaching you how to get into BPO, the BPO business. So how to generate quick cash right now by doing BPOs and how to turn that into a relationship with an asset manager so you get referrals and become an REO agent if you would like to. Um, so we'll have that on Monday and we'll talk a little bit more about our outlook. I think his is similar to mine. I don't think you're gonna see the V-shaped recovery that the optimists talk about. It could be like the U-shaped recovery we hit. It takes a little bit longer and then we come back on. Um, I saw an interesting, um, uh, one of the guys on my mastermind last night, he thinks it looks more like a square root symbol. So yeah, we've already seen the, the deep part, the, the left side of the V, but he sees it coming back up about halfway and then flatlining. So basically a correction back to a normal market valuation. So should the Dow, was the Dow ever really worth 29,000? Or should it, should it have come down to 18.5, bounce back up to 24, and then that, that established, that's the new basis value. That's his, his look on it. Um, I think just because of the amount of money we printed, I don't think that's how it's going to work. I think it will be more of the U. So you had a sharp drop. You're going to have a, a long basing period, a longer than longer than than most people are thinking basing period, and then we'll climb back out and it will absolutely roar, and you'll see lots and lots more money printed before that happens. I think um, that's my outlook. Um, somebody said, how can we leverage end of life agency services for probate references? We actually talked about this one yesterday and I don't know, it's, it's pasted. So I don't know who it was on Facebook. Um, we talked about this one on the, the mastermind call yesterday. <coughs> um, how to, how to, how building your referral network. And one of the gentlemen, he was well connected in, uh, in that industry and in senior living industry facilities. And basically what you're looking for is the person you're, you know, the question they, they're asking is, you know, how do you get upstream of that? So, um, oh, sorry guys, my screen drifted, but how do you get upstream of probate if your competition is getting to your, to the, the families first? Um, and we do that through a referral network. So nursing homes, uh, estate planning attorney, attorney, senior moving companies, um, estate planning, estate sale companies, anyone who has access to, to these elderly families or uh, to these families with elderly members at the end of life. So they're, they're talking about, you know, long-term care insurance or they're visiting these facilities or they're, they're downsizing their house to move into a patio home or anyone who they're, they're already doing business with that can, that understands that you have a service in the community that can handle anything that a family in transition needs help with. Um, that's a great person. So in nursing homes, the person you want to look for is the, whoever has the, whoever is the initial point of contact with, with the family, um, that depending on the, the level of care, um, uh, and, and the ownership, that title can be different, but it's like director of marketing, director of admissions, program manager. Those are a few that I've heard, but whoever initially meets with the family, looks at their finances, shows them the amenities and, uh, you know, determines whether they can afford to live in that facility. That person, their whole, their, their whole, like they, they're paid a base with commission. 
the more they, the more heads and beds, the more money they make. So they have a big incentive to get heads and beds. And in order to do that, oftentimes you have to liquidate real estate. And, and sometimes that just means listing it and getting, sending, you know, the listing to Medicaid. So they'll actually let, they'll pick up payments for long-term care. But regardless, if you can show these people that you, you are able to maximize the equity in an estate and minimize the time and stress involved, then your business is extremely important to theirs. It's directly complimentary. So connect with them. Um, listen to that mastermind call yesterday. We shared two or, two or three different times. We actually talked about this from an attorney perspective. But the tricks that I give you with attorneys also work with any other just take them a referral, provide value first, show up with something to give, not something to ask for. Um, I'm not sure who this is from, but uh, it says everything you've discussed has been great. I've not signed up for leads yet, but I am interested in war stories. Also curious what it's really like having a team. Are you really running a full service business? So I will go back to my history. I told you some of this in, in session one, but in 2012, I, I started in residential real estate for the first time ever. I had sold a hundred million dollars of resort, like full ownership, beachfront, ski front. I knew nothing. Um, to me, it was a pretty short learning curve. I found some blue oceans. I got to know investors, landlords, flippers. Um, started flipping my own houses, learned how to do retail listings and found it was easy as hell. Um, I was selling houses for high neighborhood comps and I had lots of great relationships and, you know, I, I did well. So I'm like, well, the next step is just teach everyone else what I'm doing so I can go scale my other businesses. So I started a real estate team. Um, and in addition to, you know, being a partner in all the leads, having an investment company, a holding company, and doing some, some stuff with private equity and, and having a, uh, you know, a resort listed uh, in, in a different state. I was spread thin. I was working seven days a week, 16 hours a day, kind of like now. Um, and I just wasn't living up to, I wasn't being true to what I said. This, this picture represents a lot for me. Um, in 2011, I hit the reset button at 29 years old and made myself some, I, I really got to know who the hell I am made myself some promises and uh, I had broken all those. I, I set out to build a bu business based on three rules that came to me on a mountaintop in Fernie, British Columbia. Always help others more than yourself. Always net six figures so you can live and give the way you like and always be able to run it virtually so you have this feeling on demand. And I wrote that in my leather journal, laid back and listen to the frogs. And like that was, I had been in the, in the wilderness in the back country of Canada for a couple of months at that point. And when I came back out, those are the three rules I've tried to build every business around, but a real estate team robbed me of that. Um, so I stepped out mainly for my personal lifestyle reasons. If you're considering a team, I'll say this, if you, you should consider building a team of admins before a team of real estate agents. And I, I've seen so, so, so many friends struggle through this and you're much better off and you'll have, you'll be able to do much more volume and share a lot less revenue. If you build a rock star admin team, like ISAs, contract, uh, uh, contract coordinators, home showers, like showing assistants, I would rather see most people have eight admins than two agents because it's a hell of a lot less work to manage the admins and you train them to do a single function. When you try to train an agent, you, you, it, it's, it's a broad skill set. And a lot of times what ends up happening on the, on the listing agent side is once, once they know how to do it, then they fly the coop. And if you're okay doing that, if you like to train and launch your competition, that's, that's fine. But it's a challenge running a team, running a real estate team is challenging. So, a lot of people think, including myself, um, I think, well, hell, I've got all these systems in place. Everything's documented. Everything's video recorded. All I have to do is bring on a motivated person and plug them in. They'll, they'll be able to, they'll be capable of what I am, probably even more. It didn't work that way for me. And it doesn't work that way for the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of team owners that I know. It's just not that easy. It, it looks great. It's so I, I called my real estate team was the metaphor I used, it was like riding a lion. 
So when you go by the general public's like, yeah, that guy gets it. Like he's, he, he's successful, man. He's riding that lion. And then on, on, when you're on the lion's back, you're like, oh, I got to pee. And if I get off, this thing's going to eat me. Like you be, I've, I've built something that was honestly the biggest threat to my lifestyle. So I would look at your lifestyle goals um, and look at the option of, can I build a team of rock star admins and, and, and like the best office team? Or do I really want to build a team of real estate agents? Um, that would be my advice. I would pick the first. Uh, Gabriel says, what is the easiest approach to ask a potential probate owner? We can get them under contract before the probate is complete. So Gabriel, as long as they have the uh, letters of testamentary, well, Kat said you're now on Zoom. Let's see. Hey, Gabriel, are you there? Yes. Um, so are you, you're saying, how do you, how do you get them under contract before probate closes? Well, to be more sensitive to the fact, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I don't want to, I don't want to be like forced for anything in the manner where we can actually say um, like the correct path, the sensitive path to tell these people, <laughs> how can we still initiate a contract but the wording to the correct wording for it to go all the way through have you been on our are you a subscriber gabriel yes and have you been on our role play calls no this is the first time i've ever been on oh really so this is just a, a series we started in, in in reaction to what we're going through right now you should go to um, a few places you can find it. If you go to alltheleads.com forward slash CCVA, Kat, can you drop the link in the, in the chat, please? Um, that's our conference call video archive. And there you can, it's, it's organized by in a kind of a calendar format. You can go in by the year, by the month. And at the, the first Tuesday of each, or excuse me, the first Wednesday of each month at 2 p.m., we do a live role play call. And I think you're going to get, you'll, I think you're going to get the most out of those. Like it'll show you how to enter these conversations. Um, and it'll, it'll give you, uh, I mean, there's, I don't know, there's 50 some hours worth of that, like almost, almost 60 hours, I think. And I think once you listen to a couple of those, you'll see the approach that we teach. Like you basically what we're using is a hub and a, like a wheel metaphor. So you are the hub as the probate expert. You provide brokerage, investment, contractors, clean-out crews, social workers, senior moving companies, you name it. What we do is we cast a broad, we have a very broad scope of service that looks like this vertically integrated solution. And it gives them 35 different reasons to reach out to us. Well, now we know we monetize investment or brokerage or both. Um, but that's how we open the conversation by really differentiating ourselves and not talking about real estate. We focus on people and situation and then once we have rapport with those people and we understand the situation and what their goals are then you just quickly segue to real estate and do exactly what they told you like be, just be the solution to what they told you their biggest problems were so that's kind of the common theme that you'll hear um, and the role play calls are great because it's unmoderated we never know what we're going to get hit with sometimes it's me role playing sometimes it's them in the hot seat so I think that's the going to be the most helpful thing I can point you to. Okay, so that one's that one's on what days? Uh, Kat just dropped the link. Oh, it's, oh, it's, so it's, it's the first Wednesday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and if you look in the Zoom webinar chat, Kat dropped the link to the call archive page. Yeah. You can also find it on YouTube under uh, youtube.com forward slash all the leads and go to playlist uh, role play. And uh, that's, there's, we have over 700 hours of content just on this conversation now. So check out YouTube. It's a little bit easier to navigate in YouTube. Everything we do there is, is also on all the leads.com somewhere. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Who did I miss? Dunley. Yeah, so Dunlevy, let me find you here. Dunlevy, you are allowed to talk if you have a microphone on your side. 
Oh, hey, I wasn't expecting to get on this, but here we are. No worries. So you've got a, you have a portfolio buyer or you're looking for a portfolio buyer? Yeah, I'm looking for one um, or a few if I could. Um, so you said 50 plus, do you mean individual deal sales or portfolio? Um, I think, hmm, that's a good question. I'll tell you this. If you can put together packages of 100 or more, I, I have your buyers. Um, the bigger the package, the better, uh, the less CapEx, the better. Like here in Roanoke, I was working on a portfolio of 860 houses, um, all, all fully stabilized, rented management in place. And the buyer took a sideline through because of this. Um, we were in like the third level of underwriting. Get, um, but everyone, everyone decided the sideline right now. And I expect when things come back online, um, we'll have that portfolio to sell. But I've, I've done several large portfolio sales. Um, and I usually end up doing both sides of it. I just leave both parties unrepresented and I do limited agency. Um, but I have several, several folks who are sitting in cash that kind of saw the credit bubble forming and they're, they're eager to buy just not right now. So if, but if you have a portfolio deal, like where, especially if it's 50 plus, um, anything up to probably a hundred million dollars in a single package, as long as it's in the same metro area and it can all be managed by the same management company, um, then I certainly have turnkey buyers for that stuff. Okay. As, long, as long as it's better than an eight cap. Okay. But so not so much the single transaction, but 50 plus a year. Um, I mean, I know people I, like, I don't, I don't know any I'm trying to think who the heck I'm sure I know somebody who's buying in South Carolina. I know people in Charleston and different places, but um, get in. Are you in our Facebook group? All the leads mastermind. I am. Yeah. So ask around in there who's, who's buying in, 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 uh, Charleston or in South Carolina. And, uh, that, that might be the best place. We've got almost 10,000 of us in there now. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I think that's all I, I had right this second, but I do appreciate everything you've been doing through all this. It's been great. Sure. Well, thank you, man. Thanks for being here. Ellen Griffith has some good news. Tell me something good. Hey, Ellen, you are unmuted. <clears throat> hey Chad. Um, so I did my first probate closing about a year ago. And I, with all my probate closings, probate now is about 70% of my business. And um, I stay in contact with all of my closed probates. So the first one, her probate didn't close until the end of January of this year. And I just got an offer accepted for her for $720,000 that she's upgrading her family with the uh, inherited very common. That's, um, that's awesome. So how much was the house you sold? 460. So 460 and you moved them up to 720 and they took that equity, used it as a down payment and bought their dream home. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a very common move. And that's what like you guys will hear me. T I mean, you, you've heard me, you've been around for a long time. You're probably okay. tired of hearing it, but you know, call every single lead, regardless of whether they own real estate, they're getting a windfall of cash that will burn a hole in their pocket. They're going to buy new cars. They're going to buy new houses. They're going to buy second homes, rental properties. And so many people are so overly confident that these leads are junk. If they, if they don't, you know, if, if, if they don't, show up on their their gis if they search the c slash yeah. mailing address and I, and they're they're stepping over hundred dollar bills to pick up pennies chad so, I, I wanted to address um the gentleman that spoke um a couple of uh people back when he was talking about you know being sensitive to the situation and with with this one she was my first so i was i was extremely sensitive to the situation and what happened with her is I had her sign a listing agreement even before she had her letters and we just didn't put a price on it and we didn't put a date on it, which meant that the contract was useless. Right. But what it did was it gave her an, uh, a connection with me 
that blocked any other realtor from stepping into my territory. And it was just more of a mental exercise than a legal exercise. Mm -hmm. And um, like you, you had advised us from the beginning, you know, I went to her and I said, you know, we're just here to provide a service. What do you need? What, what are you struggling with? How can I help you? And let me show you all the different ways you haven't even thought about in, in the ways I can help you. And we developed a very close friendship at this point. Um, and I've done that with all pretty much followed your script. I've done that with all of my clients and I probably, you know, I, I've done a lot. I have four um, probate listings waiting to go on the market and now I'm starting to push them and say, you know what, before everybody goes on the market, we're, exactly. starting, you know, let, let's go on the market now because everything is going out in multiple offers. And I'm in Los Angeles where we're completely locked down. We're, we're stay at home. Mm -hmm. And 35 houses in my immediate neighborhood have sold in the last 30 days. That's great. Yeah, I would, I, if you haven't been, have you been on these sessions? The I, I just go to the ones that I'm interested in. I think this is the third one out of 11. That I've yeah, so there, we've talked about kind of the, the analogy I use to kind of motivate people to move forward is, you know, use the, the line at Disney World. So we, we know, like, would you rather be at the front of that line when, when, every, when, the, when the gates open or would you rather be at the back? And, you know, incentive and like encourage them to get on the market before everyone else. So they've, they've got exposure right now while everybody's at home staring into their devices. Why not have a great a, a listing with a great virtual tour and some funny copy? and things that people want to share around and, and say, Oh my God, look at this house. Let's look, look what this lady wrote. And, you know, to just have listings go viral. Um, so there's some, some ideas in that. If you haven't watched uh, the session on how to prepare from the buy side, I think that was Monday, maybe. Um, anyways, if you haven't seen that one, Kat can drop the link or you can go to, uh, in our Facebook group in the top right, there's tags and click on shift happens and it'll bring up all the episodes, but you might get some ideas um, on the, the buyer one and the seller one. Um, there's some, some language in there. We talked about some ideas and tech techniques that help people move forward instead of sitting on the fence waiting. Well, thank you for sharing Ellen. Anything else you want to share with us? No, have a great day and everybody be safe. You too. Thank you for sharing. I'm glad you're doing so well. Joyce says, how do you calculate a cap rate? So Joyce, the cap rate is your net operating income, which is all of your scheduled income minus vacancy, credit lots, expenses, but not debt service or taxes. So your net operating income divided by the price you paid or the price you paid plus the repairs, whatever. Like, so if you were going to buy a house for $70,000 and it needed $30,000 in work, then you, you, that, that your value, your price is a hundred thousand. So you divide um, like whatever price you paid into that hundred thousand and that will rep be represented as a percentage. That's your cap market. That's your capitalization rate. And it's just, a, it's a metric that, that works for, everybody some people love it some people hate it but it is a good first level filter um, a lot of investors are going to look for you know in single family turnkey they're looking for eight eight to ten caps in commercial um, you know it well it just depends cap rates are all over the place but the higher that cap rate percentage the better of a, the the better of a deal it is um, the lower that percentage the higher the price you paid there they have an inverse relationship um, Investopedia is probably the best spot I could, could point you to there if you want to study cap rate. So go to investopedia.com. Um, they do a really good job teaching economics in a pretty simple format and they have a lot of real estate stuff on there. Um, Yeah, so Renee asked what my home video setup is. Um, I use a Logitech Brio 4K as my camera. Here, let me change my... Uh... All 
I'll jump over to a browser window here. Move these windows. Kat, can you tell me that now you should have my browser? Your browser. You do see it? Yep. Okay. All right. So for the camera that I'm using right now, I use the Logitech Brio. Um, I've had this for about a year, so there may be a newer version. But uh, this thing has been really good. So it shoots in 4K, um, does well in low light. Uh, oh, wow. Look at the price history on this thing. Um, yeah. So this is the one I use, Logitech Brio. Brio um, and I it looks like usually when the listings look like this, it looks like they're probably the newer version, but I don't see a listing for that. Sometimes it will say there's a new version. Look at the price of webcams. People have been paying $500 for these things. Wow. So I might change my suggestion, Renee. Um, I would probably not pay $500 for this camera, although I really like it. I paid, I think I paid $120 for it. So I use a Logitech Brio for my camera. For my microphone, I use a Yeti Blue. And you can get the desktop version. Or you can, if you go directly to Yeti's website, they sell one with this pretty high quality arm. It's got the, um, like a really nice desk mount arm. And um, this has been a really great microphone. If you want to spend less money, there's actually the one that uh, Tim Ferriss uses for his podcast, which if you don't know, he uh, has pretty high standards for his podcast, but he uses a, Um, gosh, I'm having trouble remembering the model number. This one right here. Actually, this might be the new version. I think it is. Yep, it's this one. So this one, I have the older version of this. Uh, it just has a different switch on it. It looks like they've just updated the look of it. But um, this is what Tim Ferriss does a multi-million dollar podcast on. And it's 99 bucks. And it's a USB mic, just like the one I'm on now. Um, it'll just sit in front of you versus having this big giant arm that you have to manage. Um, quite honestly, I think it, like, I like this because I can still have my hands in front of me and type. Um, so I, I do like the arm and I can swing it away from me. And it's just easier to manage with a desktop. Um, but this is another great microphone and a light. If you, if you want a light, I don't have one on right now, but if you're doing video work, go to Let's see if I can get it to come up. Um, Ryobi makes some really amazing um, work lights. One of them, if I can find it, one of them, you can actually adjust the color temperature. And that's the one I have. It looks just like this, but this doesn't look, yeah, maybe this is it. Yeah, hybrid LED color range. So I should have been dropping these links the whole time. Um, so this is a really great studio light, our office, office studio light to have. Uh, it runs on a rechargeable battery or a cord and it has three different brightness settings and the light is adjustable from like a soft white all the way up to a true like LED. Um, I'm not, not using it today. Um, but it's, if you, if lighting is important, that's a really, this is 70 bucks versus like an $800 photographer studio light. And while I'm here, I'll drop these links to the microphones for you guys too.
All right. And then we had one more. We had the camera, right? And again, I am not suggesting you pay $500 for this camera, guys. Um, you can find one with that's similar that's been reviewed. Like, do Logitech Brio versus and see what comes up. Like, what what people have put it head to head with. But um, this is just insane. I mean, you can see it was. I mean, I pay. I got it over a year ago and I paid 120. It went to 160, but then all of a sudden it just skyrocketed. This guy paid 550 for his. Um, so you can see, obviously someone has written an article about this somewhere around the middle of March. Somebody must have done a review of this camera and it just went nuts. So it's but also that, I'm trying to do the homeschooling and telecommuting. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. All right. Renee, um, let me see. Did that uh, let me did that answer all your questions, Renee? Yeah, that's perfect, actually. Thank you. All right. You just lost eight hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Happy shopping. Um, I have some other gear suggestions uh for for virtual um virtual tools that you guys can use. Uh we'll cover that in, in the next session. Um, so Renee, let's see, I, Renee, you're unmuted. You, this is your question. Uh, how would you suggest, would you suggest that st we still mail one letter per month or more for past probate leads given the current environment? So the answer to that really comes down to budget. Um, if you have, plenty of, of cash reserves, then I say mail, 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 because you're, the more you mail, the, the more, more, the higher your conversion rate will be. But if you're, if you're watching your budget right now, which you probably should be, um, I would recommend sending one letter and then just doubling it or just hammering the phones. Yeah. Um, get the letter out there that if you, if you're using the greeting card envelope with the, with the live stamp, that, that mail tends to stick around. So I would say, you know, control your budget by firing that first letter and then just relentlessly follow up on the phones until you've spoken to everybody. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, as far as books and websites, uh, that was another question you had. I actually had <laughs> probably a year and a half ago, I have an outline like a, uh, I was going to put a page on all the leads.com, like all the books that I believe would help everybody like what you should read. Um, it's a hard question for me to answer right now, Renee. Like if you, if you want to uh, just message me individually, like privately, I mean, let me know what you think you need the most and I'll have three or four book recommendations. Like for me to just name off all my favorite books is uh, it's like me naming off all my favorite food. We'll be here. all <laughs> I will. Yeah. It has more to do with, I think in that question, it was more based on the economics because more than once you, I think you have a real gift and skill to take complex issues and at least speak them into a way that we can understand it. And so I'm not looking for like high level economic stuff. I'm not an analytic, you know, that's going to, I can read it, but it's, I'm not really going to absorb it. So it's somewhere in the, in the middle of being, you know, elementary, maybe not as many graphs where I can oh, learn and speak to how, what you're, you know, telling us. I don't remember which session this was on, but, uh, well, actually, heck with it. Where is my screen still there? Am I still sharing my browser or no? I forget. No, it's just, I only see you. Okay. Well, let me find my zoom controls, wherever they went. Okay, um, so Renee, and uh, you may have, have, have been on the session, but if you go to YouTube, one of the, like for what you're looking for, like learning, getting a better understanding of economics without having to, having to be geek out the way I have, um, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember. Th- mm-hmm. Did you but watch this? this? Yeah. Yeah. Th- yeah. And, okay. Yes. And so this is for anyone who hasn't seen this. This video right here. This is. I'm, it's sad that it only has 14 million views. This is one of the most. This is one of the best videos ever put on YouTube, in my opinion, because it really takes a really complex subject of macroeconomics and boils it down into a 30-minute cartoon. Um, so that's a really good one. If you want to like take it to the next level, and one of the things that, and and this is, you know, I I, I share a lot of libertarian values. Um, I'm definitely more socially liberal than than a, a, a li- most libertarians, but. I have a lot of respect for Ron Paul and things as far as economics and monetary policy. Um, Ron Paul has, has said a lot of really accurate things in, in his lifetime. He wrote a book uh, that I read back in 08, I think is when it was called in the fed. And that, if you really want to understand how central banking works and how they influence or manipulate our, our economic machine, that would be a good book to kind of feed your appetite. I will say this though, once you look behind the curtain, you can't unsee that. So <laughs> you may be better off just uh, just listening to the guys on the news. It, it, you, you can sleep better. <laughs> I, and I grew up in Washington, D.C., so maybe I have yeah. a thicker coat. I could read the book. So that was when I first got my job with the FBI. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to have top secret security clearance. I'm going to be in these buildings. I have to know these people. So in 2005, I dug into politics, and that was – I wish I would have never looked behind the curtain. Um, I learned economics and I learned politics and man, I wish I didn't know the truth. <laughs> well, I'll leave you with this sobering message. I, I, I went to public school, but I went to school with a lot of congressmen's sons and daughters I actually grew up technically in Arlington, Virginia. And yeah. what I saw and witnessed in the eighties with that group at such a young age. And I actually said to myself, how is it that these kids turned out the way that they are like who's running our country <laughs> so that's always stuck with me <laughs> all right well thanks renee next up we have who do we have uh bill said is anyone in the office answering ticket questions yes bill our support team is working uh, we have three people working full time so uh, if you call the main line, you should get a, an answer. And if you send a support ticket, it should be answered within the day. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, let me find you here. Hey, bud, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Good. So Bud said, uh, if I understand your U versus V or V versus U, U versus V recovery, both go crazy in Q1 of 2021. So is the flipper buying opportunity coming around Q4 2020? I think so. So what we see now right now, Bud, is some, you know, we see some government forbearance ranging from two to six months with talk of 12. We see some bank forbearances that just automatically went to 12. It's all over the board. So based on who's holding the paper and what geographic location the asset is in, the forbearance could be longer or shorter. Um, That's going to create, and and then we have a judicial backlog. So we have our courts offline, even though records are like most record departments are open, the actual courts aren't open. So we're going to have to face a judicial backlog and we're also going to have to see to wait until the forbearances are lifted and those people default. So it's going to lag the distressed inventory. So yeah, my best prediction is like, I think the, the soonest we will be by like the soonest we will see a price correction with a, a, uh, where we find price resistance on the downside and can safely rush back in and spend all of our money is Q4 2020, but most likely Q1 2021 is when I think the real opportunities will come. Okay, well, I, I'd say that's good news for the probate market around here. Uh, probate most is of them, most of them are flips. Yeah, probate is um, probate's okay. Like we we don't like uh, states like California and Nevada could face some challenges because they require so much court oversight. But as long as you can get your clients full authority then we should be able to move through that and actually get these things closed faster. Um, but probate is like right now, the, the two, the two places I'm looking 
Well, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll be transparent with you guys. I, you know, we built this company because I, I believe probate is the most recession resistant niche that you can possibly be in. I built a model that uses no debt that required no, uh, no capital contribution from the partners. And we have kept the company that way. Like we've, we've built it as a zero risk business model. Um, and my personal investments, I have outstanding mortgages uh, at a 50 LTV, uh, 1%, one point origination, 15% interest. So I've got some loans that I wouldn't, I'm not originating right now, but those are out there. The opportunity, I sold everything else. I sold all my real estate. I sold basically everything. I sold stocks, sold real estate, went to money market because I didn't know that COVID was going to happen. I'm certainly not that, that much of a visionary. But I did not. I didn't trust stocks. I didn't trust uh, most real estate. I'm not. I'm not a residential landlord. So I, that one, the one asset class I liked, that I didn't want to own. Um, so what I'm looking at now, I think you're going to find individual stocks that are strongly tied to government spending. So think about things like energy, uh, defense, prisons. Anything like we have a, fail, a lot of failing infrastructure in this country. I think that you're going to see something akin to the New Deal, where government money floods into these infrastructure projects and, and rebuilds America and, and incentivizes the, the return of manufacturing and bringing that stuff back home. Any, any publicly traded companies that will be in the path of that, that government stimulus money over the next five to 10 years, there's going to be some some single some individual stocks in those classes that are undervalued right now based on emotion that will just roar into a bull market um, whenever that's that's written so i'm looking at things like that um, i'm also looking at anything owner financed if i can get real estate owner financed with a debt coverage ratio of at least 1.25 i could give a damn what the price is as long as i if i if i can account for a 15 percent reduction in rent I can negotiate no money down uh, a, a long, at least a five-year term before I hit a balloon or a maturity, then I'm taking that deal. I'll, I'll take free real estate all day long. Um, and then businesses. So I launched a company called YourSmallBusinessHub.com. It's not finished by any means, but we decided to steer a moving truck and react to the problem ahead of us. I see potentially half of all small businesses in the United States failing in the next 60 days. And somebody has to do something. So my partner, Nigel, and I stepped up and we're going to basically step into companies and help them survive. And in return, we will get equity. So I think there's opportunity in business. There's opportunity in free real estate. Um, there's opportunity in some individual stocks. Don't buy index funds. That's why that's, that's going to be a hard hit soon. Um, but those are the things I'm looking at. Those are what I believe. Uh, that's what I believe are safe investments and anything to do with, with helping families in probate or divorce. If you're looking for niches, um, divorce is hard to get leads. Like it's, it's pretty much impossible because of privacy laws and the way the data is recorded. So if you can learn to like Roger Lisi is a good example of this. He's gotten some divorce, uh, deals from probate attorneys, from attorneys who are sending him referrals. But, um, you know, if you're looking for other niches where you can really find a steady flow of, of great inventory that can be priced right to, to sell to the motivated buyers in this environment, probate and divorce are the best two, best two niches that I can think of. And then beyond that, um, that'll get you through fourth quarter. And then that's where your distress sales start. And you should know every damn investor within 200 miles of your market. Um, you should know every investor that's even knows your market or, or cause in a lot of Cal, if you're like in your market, but a lot of people from California are moving into the middle America buying now cause they got priced out of their own markets. But yeah. anyway, that's kind of my out, outlook on assets. What I'm watching right now. I appreciate that. Yeah. I think the, about the last uh, probate I sold was to a guy in Salt Lake city, just showed up with his pickup in his work trailer at the closing and, and bought it and went to work. You couldn't yeah. buy anything in Salt Lake city. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of folks in like from California buying in St. Louis and like Springfield, Missouri and, and like, uh, down around Branson, um, Huntsville, Alabama. I've, I know people that have left the West coast to come out there. Uh, Dave Gwen, I saw was on this call earlier. He's buying in Florida. He's in Colorado. He's in one of those high price markets, but 
So yeah, I mean, find out like, and if you have, if, if the buyers haven't found your market and you have very strong uh, long-term buy and hold uh, in, in your market, go find the buyers. You think any, any bulk buyer has ever heard of Roanoke, Virginia, or do you think maybe I made an outbound phone call? So sometimes we have to go find them and make it easy for them, package it up, put it all together, get it under management and then hand it to them. Sure. So there'll be a lot of opportunity. Uh, we just, I think we're just going to have to wait for a bit and probate is a great interim business to, you know, I think it will be moving before anything else. Thanks, Jed. Uh, yeah, thanks, bud. Soledad said, what's the name of the company? So uh, the company is YourSmallBusinessHub.com. Yeah, Phyllis, if you have, um, if you have large portfolios of turnkey single family, absolutely, I have buyers. Uh, Margie, I sent, actually, I gave, I dropped a link to the camera, microphone, and light that I suggested. So if you look in the, in the chat, above what you typed you'll see the links to all those things i showed you Okay. So Jerry, I was reading your question there. So Jerry, let me find you. All right, Jerry, you, you're available to talk if you have a microphone or you're able to. Okay. I think I'm on. Yeah, I can hear you. So you guys have a Homebusters franchise, huh? Yeah, we sure do. How long have you had it? Uh, a little over five years. Yeah. They're working out well for you, I guess. Yeah, it's worked out. It's worked out real well over the years. What uh, what market are you in? In Detroit. Okay. Yeah, I have a couple of friends that own own franchises. Uh, I don't know if you know Mo Matthews out of Richmond, Virginia. Sure, sure do. Yeah, Mo's a friend of mine. He's he does really well with it. He loves it. Yeah, it's done it's done really well for us. So um, we've always had this retail business. Um, you know, it's been in the family since. 1973 or so and uh we've just noticed that there's a lot of uh a lot of crossover between the you know uh, some of the stuff we deal with in home investors side versus uh probate and so we decided to do this a little while ago and i didn't realize there was such a um you know such a, a i guess a market out there for us so yeah um, well, your question was basically should like with stepping into, into probate, should you focus on marketing a brand or mar versus marketing people? And I think that you should focus on marketing a brand. The one thing I would say, the brand you mentioned was tailored real estate solutions. Is that your actual brand? That is the name of the company. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't do that with probate. Because when they think that you're only interested in real estate, they shut down and it makes engagement much harder. Okay. You, you, if you want, don't mind managing another brand, something like, you know, Detroit family transitions is something that's, it's not probate specific. It doesn't infer any death occurred or anything like that. It fits for conservatorship. It fits for like guardianship, um, divorce, probate, trust. I mean, whatever it is, like it's a family transition. So that's a brand you can really grow into. If you want to be more specific, it can be like Detroit probate, you know, D Detroit probate professionals or Detroit probate advisors or Detroit probate ed experts, something like that. But at that point, probate becomes a great keyword because in their mind, that's a very relevant word right now. It's all they've been thinking about. 
So it's good from a, a brand recognition standpoint. But if somebody who has an aging mother going into long-term care that needs to liquidate an asset to get her into long-term care, they're going to look at that and go, oh, mom's not dead. I don't want to talk to these people. So just think about what, how, where, how, how will this service scale over time? Who will you be serving? And potentially a brand like, you know, Detroit Family Transitions or, you know, Detroit Life Transitions or something like that could, could be a better fit. But okay. And any, at any rate, you we this, you know one thing that's really different about probate. If you want if you want it to be fun and easy, and you want to get all of all of the opportunity out of it, not just the desperate sellers, then you have to focus on people and situation, not real estate. And once we once once you make that shift, and you get rapport, and the people trust you, which is two three minutes in, they they because the conversation's so different you very quickly segue over to real estate and then it, they just, they literally just sign. Um, so it, it's a bit of a mindset shift compared to any other list. But what I've found, I was approaching it as a, as a, an investor. Then I approached it as a realtor. And after I had failed miserably and had like a 1% conversion rate, I finally realized I should just be Chad. And that's when it, I jumped from 1% conversion to 6% conversion and stayed there or above the, from from then on okay so that's that's my advice think about you know brands that you might not outgrow and brands that aren't real estate specific potentially not even probate specific okay thank you yeah thanks jerry yeah rich ransom i haven't seen you in a while uh, Rich said, discuss senior moving company versus regular moving company. Also, the do's and don'ts we should discuss with PRs in regards to personal property that the court requested value of. Let me see if you're here, Rich. Uh, there it is. Hey, Rich, you're unmuted if you want to join. Um, so the difference between a senior moving company and a regular moving company is the senior moving company is older. It's been in business longer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so they just have a higher standard of service. So they're going to be used to, they're going to have solutions for, you know, rather than just like a regular moving company. Yeah, whatever. We'll be there between 12 and four. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, we're going to have one of our representatives come out, sit down with you, understand your goals, get take the special instructions from you, learn what's important, and then we'll execute on that. So if she wants their, an entire grand piano bubble wrapped, great, we'll do that. It's going to be, it's going to cost. Like, but they are willing to slow down and let the, the, the customer to determine, like, let the customer communicate what their needs are and then they'll tailor a service to meet that. They just have a much higher standard of service. Now off, oftentimes that carries a much higher price tag too. But in the, at the end of the day, they take stuff and they move it from one place to another. They just have, they're just more professional about it. They're more professional and have a better bedside manner with, with elderly people. And they're more careful with the personal property because it's lots of trinkets and antiques and things like that. Um, the second part was what are the do's and don'ts we should discuss with personal reps in regards to personal property that the court requested a value of? Um, I've never had experience with that. I'm not sure. I've, I've never had the court. I mean, when usually when, when they do the inventory, the list of assets, they'll, you know, just kind of arbitrarily value personal property. And I've never had to encounter that. So Rich, if you have a microphone, if, if you're in a specific situation, I'd like to hear more about it. Um, so Margie, yes. I mean, if, if you were going to brand outside of probate, like if you thought you would be helping families in transition and divorce and guardianship and other things, then yes, you would want your website, your domain should match up to your brand. So if he was Detroit Family Transitions, then his domain should ideally be DetroitFamilyTransitions.com. Um, a little bit of a tricky thing that can get more trust more early is like a .org. So it looks like a nonprofit. You don't have to be a nonprofit to have .org. That's just the common, the common suffix they use. So 
DetroitFamilyTransitions.org might be might build immediate trust with anyone who's going through a family transition. All right, well, guys, I think that is everybody. The question queue is empty. The chat queue is empty. I'm going to jump. Um, hopefully, you found something that was helpful here today. Sorry, I didn't have our deck ready for uh, for the the tools and resources. Um, yeah, thanks, yeah, Margie. So dot org is a it's a helpful trick. But anyways, Monday, we have Frank Patrick joining us. So we will talk about how you can get into BPOs and not only make a little cash right now and over, over the next few months, but eventually impress the hell out of the REO, the asset managers, and you can become an REO listing agent if you're so inclined. So I'm going to jump. Thank you guys for being here, being part of Shift Happens. We'll see you on Monday.